Hey everyone, I want to talk about OCD and how it attaches to your values, all the kind of myths surrounding living by your values, why it's very important for other people to respect your values, why we don't need other people to respect our values, and why the reality is most people are too focused on themselves to respect your values. That's just the hard truth and reality of life. Even some of our family members, humans just naturally have myopic tunnel vision. It's just kind of how it goes. It's very hard for a person to become very self-aware and think outside of their own perception. So thinking we're going to get other people to change is kind of just delusionary in of itself. Why holding your values and having meaning that you give your own life, not universal meaning, but, but purpose to your life that you assign, which you still don't need, and you definitely don't need other people to respect it, is so key when it comes to OCD and anxiety recovery. Before I go any further, please subscribe, hit that like button, comment down below if this is something that you really struggle with. I'm going to talk a lot about the emails that we get and how they kind of sound when people go in with this especially for some of those severe POCD and harm OCD, those really sticky fears, societal rejection, family rejection, not wanting to lose you know, your loved ones and stuff like that. And if you're interested in having us help, uh, help you, please email us at info at OCDrecovery.com and we will break that down with you and you know, we can just go through it. So a lot of the emails that we get when it comes to our values will sound similar to, to this. They'll say, hey, you know, I saw your content, whether it was a TikTok, a social media post, or a YouTube video. I've been working with someone. We're really kind of compulsively going over my values. They're not giving me any actual, actual actionable steps outside of exposures. I kind of have told them the exposure, but seem like they're coming compulsive, becoming compulsive. And I'm not sure how to go about moving away from this person or should I still work with this person? Now, the first thing I want to say is it's very difficult to understand chronic OCD when you've never had it the ups and downs and how real it feels and how we desperately want to cling to a value, but then OCD knows that we're clinging to that value. So it goes and then kind of morphs it around. So the first thing that there is to break down is a myth. And the, that myth is, you know, living by your values and being true to who you are. Now it sounds really good in an Instagram post where someone's sitting on the bridge in Los Angeles overlooking a sunset, but then in, in practicality, it doesn't work out like that. Now values that we hold are unique to us and they're not unique to anyone else. Now, you'll say to me that I get combated with that and say that's a ridiculous statement, Nick, because a thousand people will have a good, uh, have a value of being a good person. But if you sat all of them down and did a 10 hour study on them and asked them questions, you'll find a little tiny differences. So yes, someone might have a value of being a good person, which there is no such thing as a good person. All, there are, all we have are people that commit good and bad acts compared to the society that we live in, because they're all society-based fears. If you go to certain areas of the world, uh, let's say you go to the Middle East where there's a lot more religious OCD, where you go to somewhere like San Francisco, there might be not nearly as much religious, religious OCD. You know, if you go to a place in the world where people marry their first cousins or get married to family members, there's not really a lot of POCD or sexual harm OCD because it's not, it's more of a societal accepted norm there. So understanding this principle is really, is really key. This is why I always talk about half of the battle, just an arbitrary number of half the battle, and not a battle, but the, the process, is understanding practicality, how OCD operates. So understanding that it's going to go for your values, especially the stickier fears where your values seem threatened. And if you're working with someone and they're constantly telling you to review your values and make lists about your values and your values are important, Yes, your values can be important to you, but they don't have to be important to anyone else. The other side of this coin is the meaning of life crowd. So, you know, the most important thing in life is to have a purpose and a meaning. Having a purpose and a meaning in life is very, very important. It's certainly not the most important thing in life. The most important thing in life is food and water. If you don't have food and water, you die. And then shelter. Uh, sounds ridiculous and asinine when I say it like that. People say that's a ridiculous statement. You're talking about semantics, but that's actually how you break down the fears in slow chunks. So it, it, it is more important. I always talk about the verbiage that you use is key. So when you say stuff over, over and over again that you can't accept yourself because it goes against your values, you have to remind yourself of the famous Henry Ford quote. Whether you think you can or can't, you're probably right. Whether you think you can or can't, you're probably right. And understanding that and becoming more comfortable with that is actually how you get better. So that is a really important part about the value thing. Now, if you look at the primary values that people have, you know, the value of being a good person, which we know doesn't exist, which you can break that down in the midst of self-esteem, the value of having a good family or monetary structure, money, the value of having a good career, 
the value of being healthy. All those things are personal decisions that the person wants to apply in their life. But if you apply those things to your life in a way where you think these must come true, I must have these, if I don't have these, life isn't worth living, that's where problems start to arise. And it is really important to cover that because that is something that held me back for a really long time. So what did I have to do? I had to look at the values. So what are my particular values? Staying away from my addictive behaviors, helping other people, trying to make them laugh, trying to spread those to the awareness, trying to be in good shape, whether that's physical shape with muscle, my cardiovascular shape with, health, with hiking, trying to build my career with my coaching and spreading those to the awareness and my business I have with my wife and all the other things and having a good marriage. These are all values that I assign in my life, but they don't need to be respected by other people. I have friends who are, say, polyamorous or people who are swingers that don't value monogamous. The problem is most people, they operate solely off acceptance means agreement. They go, wait a second, I'm religious for an example, I'm a Christian or a Catholic, or I'm Jewish or a Muslim or I'm Buddha, whatever it is, you're polyamorous, our values aren't the same, we can't be friends. That's an extremely childish and immature response that most of the world lives by. The reason why is because the discomfort of being around people with different values to yourself is uncomfortable and people don't like to be comfortable. They wanna stick in the herd mentality because in the past, culturally and evolutionary and biologically and innately, herd mentality has been passed down for a really long time. It's how people protected themselves in tribes for thousands of years. But now we're li living in a much more different world and we're, we have a lot of people with different values. Now, whether you agree with them or not, or not, there are plenty of people that have values that I don't agree with at all, but it doesn't mean I'm gonna write them off as a human because that puts your life into a box. I was listening to something yesterday where the person was bragging how they blocked 18,000 people, word for word, 18,000 people on their Twitter. That is a sign of low frustration tolerance and that is a problem. That's not something to brag about, that's a behavioral weakness. Now, people don't like when I use that term behavioral weakness, but it is important to highlight the realities of what it is. Me giving into my compulsions and me having really low frustration tolerance and me not willing to have an open dialogue was a behavioral weakness that I need to overcome. If you, one of my, another one of my favorite quotes is, the first step in solving any problem is to accept that there's a problem. Most people don't wanna accept the problem. They wanna step, jump to write to solution focus and that's great, but you do have to accept that you have OCD. You do have to accept you have low frustration tolerance. You do have to accept that other people don't have to respect your values. And it seems really good because when you look at the posts, it's like a lighthearted post with some with some words and all these different color heart shapes. And it makes you feel really good. It makes you feel really comforted. And everyone likes to feel comforted and everyone likes to feel accepted to some degree, most people. But we don't actually need that. And until you break that down, OCD is always going to have the upper hand. Now, on the other side of this coin, there's a lot of people have been wanting me to talk about religion. Now, I always tell people, we have people all the time that come in and it's really sad. They'll say, I was working with so-and-so person, and they told me I couldn't recover unless I gave up religion and I became an atheist or agnostic. Now, I'm an atheist. I believe when, when you die, nothing happens, and I believe there's no universal purpose in life. A lot of people look at that as morbid and sad, but I have a very happy life. I'm very content. I laugh a lot, and I've accepted my mortality and death. Now, I have plenty of friends who are born again saved Christians, people who are Catholic, people who are Jewish, people who live in the Middle East and are, 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 are very, very religious. And we have really, really good conversations. And then we have the whole spiritual crowd now, right? I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. I believe in different gods, etc. It's not the belief in a deity or a God that gets you into trouble. It's the demand that the God must be real. There's no way to prove whether God's real or not, no matter what anyone says to you. There's no way for me to prove whether when I die, then nothing happens. See, if I've accepted that, I've accepted my atheistic perspectives where I believe when you die, nothing happens, but it doesn't mean I know that I'm 100% correct. But if you have religious OCD and you say to yourself, I know for a fact that God is real, that's actually not true. Nobody knows if God's real or not. It's why it's called faith. I've seen God here, I've seen God there. That's fine. I'm not here to tell you what you haven't done or what you haven't experienced. I'm just here to tell you the facts of life, that no one knows whether God's real or not, no matter what anyone tells you. So until you break away from that fear, until you decrease the demand that God must exist, that I must know if there's an afterlife, I must know that there's a hell, OCD will always have the upper hand in a religious context. Now, I've worked with numerous people who have recovered, made great strides, 
with their OCD and anxiety recovery who have held on to their faith. I've worked with a lot of people who felt like they went through an identity crisis because they realized they wanted to become more atheistic or agnostic. There's no right or wrong reason here. Now, a lot of people in the religious crowd will tie the values together again, and acceptance means agreement. Where they'll say, look, in order to accept yourself, you must hold these values, which goes by Christianity or goes through Catholicism or Judeo-Christian, whatever it may be. The reality is that that can't be true because if it wasn't true, if it was true, then people who, who lose that would never be able to accept themselves unconditionally. The problem is a lot of people get scared when it comes to OCD and anxiety recovery because it does make you become much more aware of the realities of life. It's why I always use the quote Albert Ellis how to stop people from pushing your buttons. It's a quote I'll use for the remainder of my life. The optimal, not optimal, but a good mixture of contentment and happiness comes from a balance of optimism, skepticism, and realism. And if you're too optimistic, especially in the religious context, it can become a problem if you have OCD and anxiety-based disorders. Now, religion has a lot of great benefits. It can give you something to strive for to work outside yourself and help other people. I know people who have done terrific things with strong, strong religious perspectives. There, again, there is no right or wrong here. As Albert Ellis says, it's not the concern that gets us into trouble, it's the over-concern that gets us into trouble. So understanding that principle is very, very, very important when you're going through the actual process of OCD and anxiety recovery. So to kind of sum this, summarize this video, your values are unique to you, but those values will probably change, think about it. Maybe you had a value when you were six years old of believing in Santa Claus. I no longer believe in Santa Claus. So your values will change. They might, some values might stay forever, but then other values might go up and down. Like for myself, I had a huge value of taking anabolic steroids and wanting to be the most jacked guy in the room for a long time. I still like being in good shape. I still like the, uh, the feeling of being admired. I think that would be a, a, a lie if I said I didn't like that, but it's no longer a demand that I must feel good or I must feel in shape. It's a massive benefit, but I don't need that. And it's important to realize that other people are probably not going to respect your values. Trying to change the outside rules is a futile pursuit. It almost never goes anywhere for most people because people could have a hard time changing themselves, let alone working on changing other people. And the second part is religion's not the problem when it comes to religious OCD. It's the over-concern and the demand. So yes, you can recover being religious, whatever your faith or belief may be, whether it's a religion or a God, multiple gods or spiritual aspects, whatever it may be. Stoicism is a belief. Atheism is a belief. Ag being agnostic is a belief. These are all belief systems. And whether, no matter how hard we hold them, there are anecdotes and realities that can support them to a degree, but never absolutely prove. This is another great one for the existential crowd. How do we know we even die? We don't. We don't know we actually die. We know our bodies die, but we have no idea what happens after we die. We might transform. Who, I don't know. No one, no one knows. We just know our perceptions and our myopic vision of being a human. And it's really hard to look outside of yourself because most people are so caught up and worried about themselves. So thank you so much for watching this video. I know this is a difficult video to watch. This was hard for me. Again, I hold very similar values than what I did before. I had OCD chronically, but those values are held in a much more unconditional manner, not needing people to accept me and stuff like that. So thank you so much for watching. Please comment down below if this is something that you're working with someone and they're struggling with, and I can maybe give you some advice, me, Moment, and Rob. And again, if you want us to help you break this down, info at ocdrecovery.com, and we will get back to you in a timely fashion. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a great day.